And the first speaker for this session is uh, Dr. Samadhi, and the title is uh, Fraction, Fractional Flow Reserve Update. Great. Um, well, thank you very much, and I think we're going to have a couple of talks on imaging. Um, so I was asked to talk about FFR. I, I snuck in IFR because that is sort of a, a new uh, player in the field. Here are some of our disclosures uh, related uh, to this talk. Um, so essentially, you know, FFR has been around for a while. So you all know if someone were to ask you as practitioners, you're referring doctors, you know, what is FFR? Um, I usually try to keep it really simple and say it's stenotic flow divided by normal flow. That's what you want it to be. Obviously, you're not measuring flow, you're measuring pressure, and uh, the relationship between flow and pressure has to do with resistance, and that's why you give adenosine to make your pressure proportional to your flow. Um, with that said, most of you know that FFR is pretty well validated now against a number of non-invasive modalities. Um, and we also know that a lot of the reason why FFR is now incorporated into our clinical practice guidelines and even appropriate use criteria is based on the data. The DEFER study showed us that if you have a moderate lesion um, and the FFR is non-obstructive, it's okay not to do PCI, patients do well. FAME2, uh, which is the second study there, showed us that if you have an FFR positive lesion, that they tend to do better with revascularization than treated medically under the appropriate clinical circumstance. Uh, then FAME1, as you know, showed us that FFR-guided revascularization was better than angio-guided for multivessel CAD. And then very importantly, the two registries from Mayo and from France showed us that if you then incorporate FFR into your practice, um, not clinical trials, but practice, you, you result in better outcomes. Um, so specifically, what's new in terms of multivessel disease? Well, I think this trial is going to be important. This trial is not ready to present, but Bill Firon, who many of you know is a leader in the field, is um, the PI of this trial. And what it will do is take patients with multivessel disease and randomize them to an FFR-guided PCI approach versus coronary bypass surgery and it's a non-inferiority design uh, with a primary endpoint of one-year death MI target vas vessel revascularization and stroke. Um, so FAME 3 is well on its way, and it will be very exciting to see if an FFR-guided approach is non-inferior to bypass surgery for multivessel disease. Now, STEMI in multivessel disease is important because almost half our patients with STEMI do have multivessel disease. And as you know, the recent guidelines, I would say up to two, three years ago, said just take care of the infarct-related artery, don't touch the other vessels, right? That's, that was very, very clear. But as, as many of you know, the PRAMI study and the culprit study uh, suggested that on the left of your, actually on the right of your screen, uh, let's see, it's your left of your screen, that an aggressive approach of not only taking care of the infarct-related artery, but um, doing an angiographic-guided revascularization of other significant disease is better than just treating the infarct-related artery and STEMI in multivessel disease. The question then came up, well, what if my other vessels are 50 to 70 percent? Would an FFR-guided strategy of the non-culprit non vessels uh, be appropriate? And initially, the Denami Permulti study looked at that and said, okay, how about if we take care of an infarct-only approach, infarct artery-only approach versus an infarct artery plus FFR-guided revascularization of the other vessels, and that showed that the FFR-guided more complete revascularization was better. And then this year at the ACC and in the New England Journal, the Compare Acute study was presented, and this study also said that even if you perform FFR at the time of your primary PCI in the non-culprit vessels, that then revascularizing the non-culprit vessels in addition to the infarct-related artery seemed to be superior in uh, composite MACE outcomes compared to infarct-related artery treatment alone. So based on some of these data, now we've gone from 2013 to 2015 with a 2B recommendation of approaching the non-culprit artery uh, in an appropriate multivessel patient who presents with STEMI with a 2B recommendation. 
Okay, so what's new with FFR and unstable angina and non-STEMI? So now your pa patient's presented with a troponin of three. You bring them to the cath lab, and they have a 70% lesion or 60% lesion in the LAD. Can you use FFR in that setting? And these data from Hakim et al. Uh, suggest actually put a word of caution. Say that when you present with non-STEMI, that if you're using FFR and you're saying, you know what, my FFR is greater than 0.8 in this non-STEMI culprit vessel and I defer PCI, your event rates are gonna be higher than if you present with stable ischemic disease. And it sort of makes sense, right? If you have a stable plaque versus a recently ruptured plaque, perhaps in the recently ruptured plaque, the simple hemodynamic paradigm may not be what should guide our treatment. So the bottom line is, is use FFR with caution in the culprit vessel of acute coronary syndromes. With left main disease, we know the stakes are high, right? Um, it's either usually bypass or high-risk PCI versus medical therapy. We know with left main disease that FFR is a good strategy. I think if your FFR is negative for an intermediate left main lesion, you can be fairly confident to leave it alone. Again, this is non-ACS presentation. If you're going to use IVUS for left mains, and frankly, that's a time where I do reach out for IVUS if I'm on the fence with the FFR. We know now an IVUS minimal luminal area of uh, five or less is important. I wanted to say a few words about IFR because this instantaneous wave-free ratio now is the idea is to look at the pressure gradients during breast and not hyperemia, but limit it to a fixed time point in diastole when flow is pretty high compared to the whole cardiac cycle. And the punchline here is that compared to FFR, IFR has about an 85% um, diagnostic accuracy if you take FFR as your gold standard, um, which has been the gold standard for 15, 20 years in the interventional space. But the recent data from New England Journal and presented the ACC, both the Sweetheart study showed that if you look at outcomes at a year, IFR-guided PCI was not inferior to FFR-guided PCI. And then the other sister study, which was also a randomized study of IFR versus FFR-guided suggested non or demonstrated non-inferiority of IFR. And they do this with, obviously, you're not using IV or IC adenosine, so you're going to get a reduction in some of the procedural symptoms and side effects, and perhaps even a reduction in cost. I think what's powerful about these studies is they were designed to be um, aggregated, and if you combine IFR and Sweetheart, you now have 2,100 patients uh, that have been deferred based on those. And SCD here stands for stable cardiac disease or silent or, or stable ischemic heart disease. If you look at this study, you'll show that if you treat patients based on an IFR strategy, the big green uh, part of the pie, you're gonna defer more patients uh, compared to an FFR guided strategy. And that overall, even if you combine these two studies now with over 4,000 patients, there's no difference between FFR and IFR guidance for the overall patients and for those that uh, were deferred. Um, now, remember I showed you that caution about using FFR in the ACS population? Uh, when they looked at these two studies, they also found that if you're going to defer PCI based on um, FFR, that patients have slightly double the event rates of uh, those patients with acute coronary syndromes compared to patients with stable disease. But if you look at IFR, uh, it seems as though if you're deferring your lesions, it's uh, whether you have stable disease or ACS, there didn't appear to be a difference. Now, these are preliminary observations, uh, but it may be intriguing to look at. But nevertheless, it's important to recognize that physiology has made it into the mainstream, whether you're looking at the American the European uh, uh, guidelines or the NCDR, and importantly also with the appropriate use criteria now, if you have a low risk finding or no stress test or discordant data between angiography and stress test, you can now use either IFR or FFR to guide revascularization. So in summary, <clears throat> FFR guided PCI for single 
multi and left main disease is superior to angio-guided PCI and is endorsed by the guidelines and the appropriateness criteria. And FFR-guided PCI of the non-culprit lesions in patients with STEMI and multivessel disease, whether you do it in a staged fashion or at the time of primary PCI, appears to be superior to an infarct-related uh, artery PCI only. Deferral of PCI based on an FFR of 0.75 or indeed 0.8, and the culprit lesions of ACS patients have worse outcomes than those with stable ischemic disease, so FFR should be used with caution. It's important to recognize that the other tools are not great either in that scenario. You might have a hazy lesion, you're not sure what to do angiographically, whether you use IVUS or OCT, there's not great outcomes of what to do in ACS patients. I think most of us have a lower threshold to revalidate vascularize those patients, and that an FFR, an IFR-guided PCI approach appears to be non-inferior to FFR-guided with perhaps a redu reduction in symptoms and revascularization, and ongoing studies will evaluate discordances between IFR and FFR that are observed in about 15% of patients. So a lot of exciting stuff, and the main thing is that I think physiology is a large part of our interventional practice. Thank you for your attention.